Hello, dear friends. Uh, during the last several months, many people have expressed their thoughts and ideas about the problems and issues surrounding Armenia and specifically Karabakh. I had uh, recorded my opinion the way I see it in Armenian, and I have placed it in YouTube a few weeks ago. Since then, many of my friends approached me and I, they asked me to translate that uh, article or conversation into English and place it in uh, YouTube uh, as well. So our English speaking audience would hear it and understand because many of them do not uh, understand Armenian very easily and uh, for many reasons. So I sat down and I decided to translate that article into English and I am going to basically read it for you. Most of it I'll be reading it because I wrote it down and it would be unfair to just say it by heart because many of the facts and events may be forgotten or I may miss some of them. It wouldn't be correct. So let's start from the beginning, the way I wrote it in Armenian, I'm uh, reading it into English. I translated it into English. And I'm going to read it for you the way I wrote it. So during the last several months, many troubling events took place in and around Armenia. These events had the look of Gordian not showing no sign of resolution. This time around, the major headaches for the Armenian people were brought to us by the Seljuk Tatar tribes who were awarded statehood by Turks and Bolsheviks after the collapse of the Russian Empire in 1917-1920 period. We have been talking about the Nagorno-Karabakh problem for over 32 years. Many of us don't know how and where did this problem come from and how did it end up in the center of international military crisis. To get a fairly satisfactory answer to this complicated question, I was compelled to research all of the political and military events around Armenia within the last 200 years. And it wasn't an easy task. It's well known fact that the Western Armenia was occupied by the Ottoman Empire for centuries. In the beginning of the 18th century, Eastern Armenia was under control of the Persian Empire. In the year of 1603, Persian King Abbas I invaded Armenia and relocated approximately 350,000 people into Persian proper with a clear intent to energize and develop his own country. Armenians were not too happy about Persian dominance over their country and fought exceptionally long and hard for independence. It all began at the end of the 17th century when the son of one of the Sunnic Meliks by the name of Israel Ori traveled to Europe looking for allies. Eventually, Ori was advised by Western emperors and decision makers to uh, look for help from a Russian Tsar, Peter the Great. Armenian struggles for independence continued until the beginning of the 19th century when the Russian Empire moved its troops into South Caucasus proper. The Russo-Persian War of 1804-1813 came to an end with Treaty of Gulistan that was signed on October 18, 1913. 1813, I'm sorry. According to the treaty, the terrorist uh, the territories of Shirak, Lori, Ghazakh, Artsakh, and Zangizur, uh, populated by ethnic Armenians, were incorporated into Russian Empire. Yerevan and Nakhijewan remained under Persian control. In 1826, the crown prince of the Persian Empire, Abbas Mirza, assembled an army of 60,000 soldiers, broke the Treaty of Gulistan, and attacked Karabakh in an attempt to take it back. The Russian Imperial Army defeated the Persians and then on October 1st, 1827, conquered the fortress of Yerevan. Four months later, on February the 10th of 1828, in the village of Turkmenchai, a new treaty was signed between Russian and Persian empires. According to this new treaty, the region uh, regions of Yerevan and Nakhijewan also were integrated into Persian, uh, into Russian Empire. These borders remained unchanged until the overthrow of the Russian government by Bolshevik revolutionaries on October 25th, 1917. 
In December of the same year, the foreign minister, or in Bolshevik terms, the People's Commissar of Foreign Affairs, Lev Trotsky, his real name was David Bronstein, Bronstein or Bronstein, delegated his young Jewish assistant, Adolf Yoffe, to the small city of Brest-Litovsk to meet with Haki Pasha, the special envoy of the Turkish army leader, Mustafa Kemal. So Lev Trotsky sends his ally, his assistant Yoffe, and Kemal, uh, Mustafa Kemal sends his assistant, Haki Pasha. They meet in Brestitovsk in, uh, on a, uh, in, in Brestitovsk in December of 1917. A month later, on January 7th, 1918, Lev Trotsky ordered all Russian troops to vacate the entire 200 kilometer long Russo-Turkish border, uh, frontier, I'm sorry, the Russo-Turkish frontier, front line. On May, on March 3rd, 1918, one of the three leaders of the Turkish Ittihad party, the interior minister and the main organizer of the Armenian genocide, Talat Pasha, arrived in brest on a special train from Berlin. Soon uh, thereafter, a special treaty was signed between Trotsky and Talat regarding the new borders between Bolshevik Russia and Turkey. Mustafa Kemal's army had a green light to move east towards the city of Kars. It would be very appropriate to uh, mention that same words has used British Prime Minister Churchill about that event. But that's besides the point. Only five weeks later, on April 12th, 1918, the chairman of South Caucasus Republic, also known as same, they called it same. Representative of Georgia, Chenkeli, ordered the military commander of the city of Kars, General Azarbekian, to turn the city over to Turks and leave. Immediately thereafter, that, uh, uh, immediately after that call, Chenkeli ordered to disconnect the phone and cable lines between Tiflis and Kars. As a result, General Nazarbekian could not communicate with the Armenian members of the Caucasian Republic, same. It took two days to vacate the entire city of, of its population. A month later, Turkish army crossed over the river Ahurian, and on May 21st, 1918, the fateful battle of Sardarabad began. It ended on May 26th, 1918. The Armenians defeated the Turks and saved the remainder of their country. We have to mention the obvious fact. British troops were too far in Iran. Russians were too far in the north. Turks were left alone to fight against Armenians and lost. On the same day, May 26th, 1918, in the city of Tiflis, the capital city of Georgia, the Southern Caucasian Republic, also known as same, self-dissolved. Under the pressure of the Georgian members, same had to dissolve itself. Uh, consequently, the Georgians declared themselves a Republic of Georgia. The Turkish Tatar members departed toward the city of Baku, but were forced to stop in a small town of Ganzak, at that time it was still Ganzak, and declared themselves a Republic of Azerbaijan. On May 28, the Armenians similarly declared an independent Republic of Armenia. A few days later, a few weeks actually, a few weeks later, they left Tiflis for Yerevan. They declared the independence in Tiflis and then they went to Yerevan. Dear friends, let's shift our attention to the city of Baku. On April 25th, 1918, local Bolshevik revolutionaries seized the power in Baku. On the next day, May 26th, in Gazak, the Turkish Tatar nationalists, the former members of Caucasian Saim government, declared a new independent Republic of Azerbaijan. Meanwhile, the advancement of Russian Bolshevik rule and the uh, turmoil in Caucasian republics forced the British government into action. In June of 1918, during a meeting at War Ministry of Great Britain, then Prime Minister David Lloyd George said the following, beginning of the quote, it would be better for us for the Turks to hold Baku as it was not probable, probable they would ever, ever 
be dangerous to our interests in the East. Whilst, on the other hand, Russia, if in the future she becomes regenerated, might be so, end of quote. The words remain as relevant today as they were in 1918. Let's go back to Armenia. After receiving the city of Kars without any resistance, the Turks took all of the weapons and ammunition belonging to the Armenian army. Soon thereafter, Nuri Pasha, who was the brother of Turkish war minister Enver Pasha, led a large contingent of the Turkish army over the territory of Georgia toward Azerbaijan. They used the railroad Tiflis-Baku. Once he reached the mostly Armenian populated city of Ganzak, Nuri Pasha set aside a brigade of Turkish soldiers under the command of Jamil Javid Bey, gave him orders to reach the city of Shushi to disarm and massacre the local Armenian population. The Karabakh Armenians did not concede, instead broke up into small groups and continued the armed resistance. Their leaders decided to send an envoy to General Andranik, who was in Zangezur at that time, for military assistance. He agreed to help and moved his troops toward Karabakh. Before he could reach Karabakh, he received a letter from Sokrat Beg Melik Shah Nazaryan and the mayor of the city of Shushi, Gerasim Melik Shah Nazaryan, advising him not to enter the city. As a result, General Andranik returned his troops back to Zangezur. Meanwhile, on December 2nd, 1918, a small military attachment of British troops arrived in Shushi for negotiations with local Armenians. The British tried to convince the local population that they should accept the Azeria rule and wait until the peace conference in Paris uh, brought a final solution to all territorial disputes. Armenians categorically refused to accept the Azeria rule. Only a month later, on January 15, 1919, the Azeri government of Baku, in complete agreement with the commander of the British Army in Baku, General Thompson, appointed the fierce enemy of the Armenians, Khosrow Bek Sultanov, as a governor of Karabakh at Zangezur. Eleven days later, on January the 26th, the foreign minister of the Republic of Armenia sent a decisive complaint to the government of Azerbaijan and General Thompson with a strict affirmation that Karabakh and Zangizur are an indiv indivisible part of Republic of Armenia. On February 12th, the National Committee of Karabakh refused to accept Sultanov's authority. After all the failed attempts by the Azeri government in mid-April, the colonel of the British army in Baku, Shatalwort, I repeat the name, Shatalwort, traveled to Shushi, trying to convince the Armenians in Karabakh to accept the Azeri rule. On April 23rd, the National Assembly of Karabakh Armenians unanimously turned every attempt to put them under Azeri rule down. During the next three months, the British army assisted Azeri authorities to remove Armenians from their villages and massacre them. The Armenian population suffered heavy losses and by August 15, 1919, they decided to remain temporarily within the Azerbaijan Republic in anticipation of more positive results at the Paris Peace Conference. On the same day, August 15th, 1919, the most civilized nation on earth, the British Empire shut down its embassy and left Armenia. In my uh, previous program, I have mentioned that at the moment when British ambassador was bringing down the flag of their own uh, building, the prime minister of Armenia, Khatisian, was standing next to him and crying. And he declared that it would be the end for the Republic of Armenia. A question here remains, did Karabakh Armenians know about British departure? Months later, on April 28, 1920, 
with the approval of Bolshevik Lenin and uh, Turkish leader Mustafa Kemal, the Bolshevik Red Army entered into the city of Baku and the Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan was born. On November 29th, the 11th Red Army entered Armenia and its government resigned in favor of Bolsheviks. The peace conference in Paris never picked up the question of the Karabakh uh, Armenians. That question was raised only on July 4th, 1921 in Tiflis at the Bolshevik party conference where Joseph Stalin first decided to leave Karabakh within the Republic of Armenia. By the next day, July 5th, Stalin changed his mind. Well, it's hard to say whether or not he changed his mind or he got a call or he got a telegram, whatever he got. And he decided to incorporate the densely Armenian populated region of Karabakh within Azerbaijan. Two years later, in July of 1923, the autonomous region of Nagorno-Karabakh was created within a Republic of Azerbaijan. It lasted until the collapse of the USSR. On September 2nd, 1991, the Regional Council of the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh decided to secede from both Republic of Azerbaijan and USSR based on the constitution of the Soviet Union. Soon afterwards, an attack on Nagorno-Karabakh was launched by the combined Soviet and Azeri troops. Combined Soviet and Azeri troops. Does this remind you anything recent? The war ended in 1994 by decisive victory by Armenian troops. A ceasefire was signed between Azeri and Armenian republics which lasted until the September War of 2020. To this day, none of the Karabakh committee members or any of the Armenian leaders has answered to the question, specifically answered. Why is it that since 1994 Bishkek ceasefire, a peace treaty has never been signed? Only the first president of the Republic of Armenia Levon de Bedrisan insisted that the territories surrounding the Nagorno-Karabakh autonomous region must be returned to Azeris, justifying the idea that, quote, the international community will not agree with Armenians and will insist on returning those territories to Azerbaijan, end of quote. The question still remains, who is this invisible international community? And are these just people or states or specific governments? Looking back, back at the events surrounding Armenia from 1918 to 1920 and the events between 2018, 2020, exactly 100 years later, we are compelled to see the obvious similarities. Between 1918 and 1920, the Jewish Turks, Russian Jews, Tatar Seljuks massacred the Armenian people anywhere and in any way they could. Georgia's government signed a treaty with Turks, which cut off the rail communication with Armenia, blocked all the remaining roads, disarmed and killed the Russian troops returning to Russia from Turkey and finally killed thousands of Armenian genocide survivors trying to flee to safety in Russia. In June of 1920, the Reverend H.W. Harcourt, the Anglican chaplain in Transcaucasia, reported to London that the Allied High Commissioner for Relief, William Haskell, had been diverting all the available flour earmarked for Armenia to the government of Azerbaijan in return for cash payment. Later, on November of 1920, when a British foreign office was informed through General Bagratuni, the unofficial Armenian representative in London, Aviti Saharinian, would come to London to depict personally the desperate situation in the country. Osborne prepared a brief for the seniors his seniors. He wrote, His Majesty's government is not a charity organization. 
and uh, that instead of uh, perpetual appeals for foreign pity and assistance, we should like to see evidence of some self-reliance and political ability in Armenia, that the uh, continued existence of Armenia has an autonomous state, is independent on Armenian efforts and capacity, and cannot be based on foreign armies and foreign money." End of quote. Armenia's pleas were left unanswered. They were completely abandoned. That was in November of 1920. Today, reminiscing about the most recent Karabakh war that took place in November of 2020, we are searching for a logical explanation to the question as to why do all these wars happen around Karabakh? The answer seems to be in plain sight, right in front of our eyes. Everything is based on a brotherly treaty between first Tsarist Russia and Bolshevik Russia on one side and the genocidal Turks on the other. That was signed on March 3rd, 1918 in a small Russian town, Brestidovsk. The organizers and signers of that treaty were Bolshevik Trotsky and Talat Pasha. They designed the boundaries between Turkey and Russia that have not changed since. Based on that treaty, Bolsheviks supplied Mustafa Kemal with millions of rubles worth of military and economic help. Turks were able to rearm a new army, conquer the rest of the Western Armenia, and by mid-1920, they reached the city of Kars. In return, Mustafa Kemal ordered the Mustafa, uh, uh, Musafat Tatars, those are the nationalist Tatars in Baku, to embrace the Bolshevik army in April of 1920 in the name of the victory of world revolution. On December the 2nd, 1920, the Armenian government resigned to Bolshevik rule. The next day, on the 3rd of December, Bolshevik Legran, reconfirmed the Bolshevik-Turkish treaty in Alexandropol. On the 16th of March, 1921, in Moscow, a treaty of brotherhood and friendship was signed between Russia, Russia's Bolshevik government and Mustafa Kemal's government. That same treaty was reconfirmed in the city of Kars on October 13, 1921, same year. On July the 5th of the same 1921, at the conference of Bolsheviks uh, in South Caucasia in Tiflis, Joseph Stalin single-handedly decided to leave all the Karabakh within communist Azerbaijan. The painstaking efforts of the uh, British government to deliver Karabakh to uh, Azeris finally came to fruition in the hands of the British spy Joseph Stalin. At the end of the World War II in 1945, Stalin tried to move his army into Eastern Turkey or Western Armenia. The 25th anniversary of Moscow Treaty was on the horizon. Unfortunately for Stalin, the British Prime Minister Churchill would not let him accomplish his task. Instead, Eastern Europe fell under domination of Soviet Union. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991-1992, Armenians in Karabakh decided to declare independence from, uh, for themselves. Azeris started a war against Karabakh. However, with, uh, without any outside help, they lost the war. Turkey tried to help their brothers and moved their army closer to the Armenian border. Russia's defense minister, Grachov, took a flight to Ankara, calmed the Turks down, and reminded them of the existing treaties between Russia and Turkey. Shortly thereafter, in the city of Bishkek, a ceasefire was signed between Armenia, Karabakh, and Azerbaijan. The most recent Karabakh war in September, in reality, had the single purpose of reestablishing the control over their zones of influence. Turkey would maximize its control over Azerbaijan and Nakhichevan, and Russia would re-enter Karabakh. After thoroughly looking into the military and political events 
in the Western Armenia and Caucasus, one comes to an obvious conclusion that all the events were based on a political marriage between Russia and Turkey, having Great Britain as a godfather. Needless to say that all territorial, all political <clears throat> issues that have arisen since then have been settled by a very heavy cost to the Armenian people. Whatever conclusion we may arrive about the latest Karabakh war, that it is more than obvious that the Armenians were attacked by three countries and were forced to lose the war. But why? To make my point, let me use a quote from the former American president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who said, the beginning of the quote, in politics, nothing ever happens by accident. If you think something happened by accident, that's exactly the way it was planned. The latest Karabakh war was planned and carried out by Kremlin, but was approved by NATO and London. It had to end exactly the way it, has, it was planned. Just like in the game of chess, only the king is allowed to win. All other players from queens to pawns are subject to sacrifice. All that is left for us to do now is to wait for the next move of the latest Russian Tsar Nikolai III Putin. The logical explanation for the beginning of the uh, and the end of this war is a fairly simple one. In the event of a victory by either side, either Armenia or Azerbaijan, the Russian army would have no reason or explanation to intervene into Karabakh proper. Russia would lose Karabakh for good. The way it ended is the only acceptable outcome for Russia and Turkey. The time has arrived for Russia to start the final Russification of Armenia. The vicious plan for the step-by-step -step destruction of Armenia and Armenian people, which started in July of 1878 in Berlin, came to an end on November the 9th in Moscow. As a conclusion, I would like to express my sincere hope that with a reduction of the oil reserves in Baku, the British, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, and many other money-hungry masters would leave Baku so that the Southern Caucasus region would enjoy well-deserved peace. Although I'm not sure that the Russians and Turks would let that happen. All we can do is to regroup ourselves, rearm, reunite, and rebuild our homeland. May we finally learn from history. Let me repeat, may we finally learn something from history. That's all, my friends. Thank you.